Hello, and welcome to Writer's Group Therapy. I'm Tom. And I'm Roshni. We're writers helping writers with whatever writing ailments you might have. Whether it's related to your craft or your career, we can help. Are you ready for your session? The The doctors doctors are are in. in. Our guest today is producer, director, and writer Jeff Deverett, owner of Deverett Media, a film production, distribution, and consulting services company in San Diego. Jeff has seven feature films produced and distributed, three of which I believe are on Netflix. So uh, thanks for coming on the podcast, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. I came across you because I was watching the Film Courage YouTube channel, and you did a video there called, it was How to Get a Movie on Netflix. And I thought it was really interesting. So I looked into your background a little bit. And uh, it it seems like you had an interesting path to uh, writer, producer, director, because you actually started off in the legal and financial side of distribution. That's true. Yeah. You know, I came in through the business side of the film business and then made my way into the artistic side, which is what I always wanted. But, uh, you know, financially and uh, made more sense in terms of my career to start on the business side. So the Hollywood Reporter had an article just recently about spending on streaming services is going up to like 112 billion this year. So it seems like it's a great time to produce for streamers. And it seems like that's kind of your niche. Is that true? And is that why you focus on that? Um, I wouldn't call it necessarily my niche. My my niche, and by the way, I use the word niche because I'm formerly from Canada and niche is a French word. So uh, a lot of Americans call it niche, but it's I won't hold that against really you. niche. <laughs> um, my niche, I like to think, is trying to make commercially viable independent features. Um, so to make a indie feature commercially viable, you have to figure out where to sell it. And and just based on the statistic you just said, selling it to streamers has become one of the main sources of revenue. So um, I don't make movies necessarily for the streamers, um, just they happen to be very good customers, especially Netflix for me. And so that's where it goes. But, you know, if a cable network or some other outlet was more interested at a better price, then I would be happy to sell to them as well. Now, most of your films are the kind of this family drama comedy uh, genre. Yeah, I like, is that just your, is that your just your preference? Or I, I definitely like to do family movies. Um, I, it's yeah, it's a personal preference, but I tend to lean towards um, true stories that are sports dramas. So I like to talk about, and the reason I like that is I really, really love inspirational and aspirational movies where a character has to overcome some type of adversity and not necessarily win just really try hard and give it their best. And, and, you know, um, so they don't have to win the contest or the, you know, or the competition. Um, they just have to try their best to make the comeback. It's kind of like Rocky. He doesn't win, you know, in the first movie, he doesn't win the, the fight, but he goes 15 rounds, which is, I find very, very inspirational. That's cool. Um, yeah, your one of your movies on Netflix is a uh, Full Out Two. Uh, you got this as a is a gymnastics is focused on, right? Yeah, that's my most recent movie. I actually, just started uh, this in January of this year. Okay, and that, that's a true, I mean that's a true story. Shot in at the University of Oklahoma about them going for their second national championship, but their star athlete um, leaves the team. Their number one sort of captain star athlete leaves the team to go to try out for the olympics and the question is you know can the team pull together without their number one player and they do i just gave the ending away sorry <laughs> spoilers <laughs> that, that's why i made the movie because I, I felt that way listen they didn't have to win but you know in this case it was fun that they did now you, you've you've sold this movie and i think you said two others to netflix so far do you find that these kinds of stories are very desirable uh, on Netflix and that, uh, or have you talked to other streamers and learned kind of what they're interested in as well? Yeah, I think these stories are universal and always will be. I mean, family genre movies, you know, will always have a a place in society because there's always going to be families and, you know, parents and families like to watch together sometimes, whether it's parents or grandparents with their children. So the family movie genre, I mean, I've been in distribution my whole life. I don't want to tell how old I am, but over 30 years. And I've always been able to sell family genre movies. 
um, they're not really um, sensitive to time or whatever as you know that then they don't go through trends the way say horror movies do or sci-fi or whatever there's always families that want to watch family movies so i like that genre for that reason that it's always going to be commercially viable um, specifically the sports drama side that's that's a particular niche that i just enjoy i mean i my favorite movie is rudy the football movie um i just find that there's so much heart in that movie and uh i just love telling sports stories like i say where where people you know try to overcome adversity that's really cool um from a writing perspective do you have any tips or advice on picking your your budget and your genre your type of movie for people who are writing for this market that's growing, the streamer market? Yes. Is there anything different than doing like, you know, theatrical? I, I definitely, I have three really, really important tips. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this show and talk to you, because I do want to share this with writers out there. Now, as you correctly mentioned, I did not come from the artistic side of this business. I did not go to film school. I did not have any formal training in writing or directing. Um, I have a law degree and a, and a finance degree, so I have a lot of experience in producing and understanding all those elements. So I'm going to put this up front before I make my comments. I'm not a trained writer, and I'm not even nearly as good a writer as any of the writers that I'm sure you deal with or talk to or you know, or speak to on a regular basis. Those writers, I respect writing to me is the core of the entertainment business, and I don't think writers actually get enough credit because they're the ones who are the most creative and come up with the ideas. You know, it actually aggravates me a little bit that, that directors get all the credit because writers really are the, are the architects of, of a movie in my estimation. Um, they're the ones who create the story. Um, the director just tells the story. Now, I'm not belittling that. I think that's important, but I, I really think that writers should get more credit. Now, the reason they don't maybe, and the reason why writing is not as respected in the indie film world as it should be, I'm going to give three tips right now to writers who are listening to this podcast. And, and this is strictly from a producer's point of view. So I'm wearing my producer's hat when I say this, all right? I'm not necessarily wearing my artistic hat because um, I don't have a great artistic hat, you know, but I, I have, you know, decent, but um, this is from a producer's point of view. So there's three things that I think that writers need to really think about when you're writing for an independent, you know, writing an independent movie. Now, what I'm about to say does not pertain to big budget Hollywood movies. So let me make it clear. I believe that big budget Hollywood movies are a different business altogether, a totally different discipline and different model than small budget indie films. So my comments only are pertaining to small budget indie films. They, they don't, they're not going to be relevant to big budget Hollywood films. Um, okay, so the other thing I want to make very clear is that what I'm about to say pertains to commercially viable indie films, all right? If you're just making a film because you have a story to tell and, or a message to share with the world and, it, and, and you don't, you're not worried whether or not you're going to make any money with the movie, then that you can do whatever you want. Hopefully you've got enough money to do what you want. You don't have to worry about making your money back. But the comments I'm about to make, the three tips are based on if you want to try to make a commercially viable indie film. And I'm not saying you have to compromise your, your vision or anything like that. You just maybe have to think about three things that maybe you haven't thought about before. So as a writer, the first thing that you, you might want to do and um, Tom, I, I, if you want to interrupt me, just let me know, okay? But uh, I'm going to just go through these. So this is what, a, you, you, what you might, as, as a writer, you might want to think about before you write what a producer has to think about. So I'm a producer, and I'm going to tell you what I think about before I would hire any script to be written or before I would even look at a script um, when, I, when I'm considering which scripts to acquire to make movies from. So. Think about, like, writers think, oh, I don't have to think as a producer because I'm not a producer. Producers think as producers. But if you're a writer and you think about what a producer is thinking about, then you might be more successful as a writer. So the first thing a producer thinks about before they ever go to camera, before any pre-production happens, before anything happens, 
the first thing a smart indie producer thinks about is who is their audience? Who is their core niche audience? All right. Now, sometimes people say, well, my audience is the whole world. Everybody's my audience. And, you know, that might be the case. It might be that, you know, it's a very generic film that could play to the, listen, my films are family films. They have very, very wide audiences. But you know what? It's way too hard to conquer the everybody audience. That's like conquering the world. And for an indie film, you just aren't going to have the financial resources to do the marketing that it takes to conquer the entire world, which is everybody. So what you have to do, and this is what producers, smart indie film producers do, is they they focus on who the core audience is, that little niche audience. So what you want to do is you want to conquer just a little piece of the world to start with. And then if you conquer that, go to the, you know, widen it a little bit and widen it. It's kind of like what you do as a platform release, get a little bit of success, then get a little more then a little bit more. So if all else fails, who is that core, real core niche audience? If nobody else is going to watch your movie, then who are those small group of people that you can rely on to actually watch your movie? Because if you don't have an audience, I hate to say it, you can't make a commercially viable film. So as a producer, if you don't think about who your audience is before, you know, and choose the right script, because, you know, you for the audience that you want to go to, like, this is the mistake that most indie producers make. They first, they make the movie and then they think, okay, now who am I going to sell it to? Well, it might be too late because you might not have an audience to sell it to because it might be too difficult to either one, identify that core audience or two, to get to them. So okay. as a writer, I think you really got to focus on who is the movie being written for. And, you know, sometimes writers don't think about that. They don't, they just say, this is the story. I have a great vision. I have a great idea, but it's not like, okay, now who's going to market where, who are we going to market the movie to and, and how's it going to get marketed? Because they say, well, that's the producer's job. He'll, they'll, they'll figure that out. Yeah, I often uh, think about my films as things that won't win awards, but will win people to, you know, want to see that. So a lot of times these movies win awards. They're fantastically constructed and produced in film movies, but they're not like, they don't draw huge crowds. Fair enough. You see, as a producer, not only do I think about who, who the, like the number one thing I think about who's, who the core audience is, but the number very closely related is how am I going to create awareness with them? What am I going to do to market to them? to let them know that, you know, can I get to them, first of all, and, and to let them know that the film's available. Because remember, Hollywood films, you know, a $50 million Hollywood film will have a $25 million marketing budget. You know, a $500,000 indie film, if you're lucky, has a $5,000 marketing budget. Nobody leaves any money for marketing. So um, you got to think about how you're going to get to that audience. Now, writers often don't think about that, but if they did think about that and they said to the producer or the director, Hey, I have an idea, you know, this is who I think the core audience is for this script that I'm writing and how, you know, this is, you know, you don't, you don't want to poke your nose into something that you're not, you know, invited into, but it's very helpful. If a writer ever said to me as a producer, you know, I think that this would be very well good to to market to this group. And I think this would resonate really well with these people and, you know, just my ideas. And, you know, I don't want to tell you how to do your job. I would very much welcome that. I think that would be really insightful for a, a writer to be thinking about that and offering those suggestions. So that's number one, who your audience is and how to get to them. All right. Number two is once you've figured that out as a writer, um, have you, are you actually writing your script to satisfy that audience or are you writing it to satisfy your own vision? Now, those aren't necessarily mutually exclusive concepts. Like you can satisfy your vision, tell your story, you know, share your message while still writing to that audience. But often I, I encounter lots of writers who have no um, you know, really have to do not at all focus on who the, what the audience wants to see. They only focus on what they want to tell. So this is kind of like you have a story. This, this is like, you know, stuff that's like, you know, that you think about in a party. So you have or, or in a business meeting, 
Um, I often say when you're going into a business meeting, you know, to pitch people or to have a meeting, it's not about just every, it's not necessarily what you're going to say. You have to read the room and understand who you're saying it to. And sometimes in some rooms, you say this, you know, you have this exact same content, but you might use different words or say it a little differently to whoever's sitting in that room. Because in one room, it might be different than, you know, the chemistry in a different room. So you have to kind of read the audience reaction, um, read the room. I mean, I don't know if anybody, if I'm sure some of your writers play poker. It's, this is poker strategy. It's like, yeah, you play your cards, but you also have to play the other players. You got to know who the players are. You got to take, you got to kind of read them. And so, you know, and you got to know how to play your cards, sure, which is the story. But telling the story is kind of reading the room. So I find that a lot of writers really don't think too much about what their audience wants to see. They just think about what they want to tell. So if you take a step and let me give you a little, little like sort of um, example of that. All right. Um, yeah, sure. So in one of my movies, like this is a tiny, tiny little example. Okay. Um, I had a movie and um, it had, you know, a fair bit of bad language in it. One of the characters, it was very, very, um, one of the characters just, that was the, that was the sort of the nature of the character. She used a lot of F-bombs in her, in the way she spoke. And I, I wrote the movie, so I wanted it. I intended it that way. But then I th thought to myself, okay, you know what? Um, this, the audience might not want, be as receptive to that as I am to writing it. Like I really enjoyed writing it and it was a fun character and it was, everything was in character. But then I stopped and I said, Will the audience be as receptive to that? Because who is the audience? And ironically, as crazy as this sounds, that movie um, has a very strong appeal in the faith-based audience. Because it's, it's also, even though there's a lot of swearing, it sort of is a family movie that deals, it's not necessarily family, but it deals with concepts that faith-based people might be interested in. So then I said, will the faith-based market be receptive to that amount of swearing? And what I did was, Basically, I rewrote the script, taking out a lot of the swearing, but trying to keep as much of the sensitivity of the character in there, but with different words. And you know what we ended up doing? And again, I directed this movie too, so I, I was in control of what we could do. We actually had two scripts. They were almost identical. One had swearing, one didn't. And we, we shot both scripts because the setups were there. So this is a tip like for writers. You can write the kind of two versions, and it's not the whole script, by the way. It's just a couple of scenes. Sometimes it's usually just one or two lines. So when you're set up, like think, okay, you have this, you're set up to shoot a scene, and one character, you know, does says, let's say, lots of bad language in one line, and then you just shoot it, reset it, and have that character say regular language in the exact same line. So you have coverage on both. For two reasons. One is you can make two versions of the film, maybe one for the faith-based market in this case and one for the regular market. Or two, you have an option in editing afterwards because maybe your distributor will say to you, hey, you know, if only you had this with a little less swearing, you know, and maybe we could get a PG-13 rating as opposed to an R or maybe even a PG as opposed to PG-13, blah, blah, blah. So at least you have the coverage. It's actually not that difficult to do. So some of your writers are probably listening to this saying, ah, it's like writing two scripts and everything. It's not. It's the exact same story, but you just have to think about who your audience is. So let, let me give one other example of that, okay? In my first movie, in my first gymnastics movie, which was Full Out, um, the second one's Full Out too, obviously, but the, the first one is Full Out. There's a scene in there where the girl has a romantic interest and with one of the dancers, one of the other kind of gymnast dancers. And they're together in the gym and the, the big moment comes and every, there's all this tension and everybody wants to see the big kiss. It all leads up to the kiss. And so um, we go and, you know, and we shoot the kiss. But I know because I'm the producer and I know that I'm selling the movie and I know who I'm selling it to. Like I haven't made the sale yet, but I want to sell this to the Disney Channel, this movie, because it is so Disney-esque, right? So I also know from past experience to selling, you know, family movies that if you have a big, juicy honk and kiss on the lips, it's going to be a tough sell to the Disney Channel. Back then, anyways, maybe not now, but back then. 
So what we do, I say, okay, great. We got the kiss. Now let's reset. Let's shoot the exact same scene with a kiss on the cheek as opposed to on the lips. And the crew is like, ah, why? This is so beautiful, this great scene. And even, you know, no, no, guys, because I'm selling the movie. You're not. We need this. Sure enough, we do it. We do it my way, the hug, the kiss. What do you, which version do you think sells to Disney? The non-kiss on the lips, the, the, the cheek kiss. So this is stuff that as a writer, certainly as a director, writer, um, and producer, you, you, you really ought to think about this stuff before you go to camera. Um, you got to think about who you're going to sell it to and what is appropriate in terms of your writing that will make it saleable or commercially viable to the customer that you actually hopefully want to sell to. And cool. you can do both. Like I'm suggesting you can write two drafts or you can have alternate scenes and alternate coverage, which actually makes sense to do because afterwards it gives you some options and it's really, really not that expensive to be able to, well, you know, in terms of writing it, it's not, but even. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, what's number three. Number three is make sure that if you are a writer, that you're writing to the budget level that a script can actually be shot at. Now, you don't necessarily know what that budget level is, but also you might want to write, say, some of the scenes that are these big, big, huge, expensive scenes. Like it's so easy with a you know, pen and paper typing on a keyboard to say, okay, you know, now character gets on a rocket ship and flies to the moon. You know, that's one line in a script, no problem. That is a gigantic, gigantic thing to shoot in a movie, right? You know, that's obviously a very extreme example. So um, why did, you know, writers often say to me, you know, why is the director, the producer, whatever, always rewriting my script? How, why can't they just take my script and shoot it as is? Why does everybody always have to do a rewrite? And the answer is in an indie movie is because we can't afford to shoot your script the way you wrote it. We love your story. You know, we love your characters. We love everything about it. We just... We can't afford to put, you know, 5,000 people into an arena and shoot this scene three times in diff three different places in a period piece movie because we don't have enough money. So can you figure out how to write it in a way that can make it not, a, not compromise your story, but, you know, make it in a way that's viable for us to shoot it for the amount of money that we actually have? So be very cognizant of the budget level. And, and this is another thing I say, you know, there are only probably three or four major scenes in a movie that, you know, these big production scenes have alternates for the producer or the director. Instead of them rewriting your script, you write it, rewrite it. And not be before you give it to them, say, hey, here's a version you could shoot for a million dollars that would be really nice, the one I really want to tell. But if you only have a half a million, you know, here I wrote, I changed some of the things that could make it far more viable to shoot it at that budget level. So that's the third thing. Now, speaking of budget, uh, and since you are, you know, I know you're in San Diego and you do a lot of indie films. Do you normally shoot outside of California and Los Angeles? Like, do you take it to other states and other countries or do you try to keep it local? Um, I, I do. And I feel bad about saying this because I... I love California. I love living here. And I'm very supportive of the California film industry. But unfortunately, right now in California, the tax credits are not, there are no tax credits available for movies under a million dollars. So indie films, if, and tax credits is a very important component of financing an indie film. Um, other states offer much, much more viable tax credit um, solutions for budgets under a million dollars. California doesn't. And you know what? I've been trying to fight that for years, not even fight it. I've been working with the California Film Commission and kind of begging them to consider budgets below a million dollars. And even if you're at a million, it's so hard to get money. You know, it's so hard to tap into that. Whereas in other states and other countries, it's so much easier. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I would never want to leave. Like, why would you ever want to leave San Diego? I mean, I've been here. It's such a beautiful place. I love living here. The weather, every, we have every type of terrain and cityscape and everything you could imagine. You'd never have to leave here. The only reason you have to leave is because you can't get any financial incentives here. And that matters in terms of financing a movie. Now, this might be then piggybacking off that a bit of a tricky question. I'm sure you're looking at scripts right now for your next production. But how has COVID and all the restrictions and lack of vaccine and stuff that, how has that changed your producing strategy with independent films? 
Yeah, I know. It's it's made it so difficult, honestly. Like, first of all, um, I'm I'm a bit of a rule follower in terms of doing it properly. Um, I have lots of, I'm going to call them friends who I know who are shooting sort of under the radar now and not doing pro- COVID protocol. And I'm just not interested in that, to be honest. First, first of all, for my own personal health, I just don't want to take chances. And secondly, I'm just respectful of other people's health. Thank you. And so it just doesn't make sense. Look, at as much as it's been really trying, and I, and I had a movie that I was going to shoot last fall that got canceled um, or postponed. It's not canceled, it's just postponed. And everybody was disappointed. I was disappointed. Um, you know, I had some pre-sales on it. They, my customers were disappointed. Um, but health comes first in my estimation. We all have to be responsible right now. I mean, hopefully this too shall pass. It will. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. But right now is just one of those crazy years that I'm going to write off as being a crazy year and saying it happened and hopefully we can just get past it. Hopefully, yes. The Back to the pitching to Netflix, because uh, you know, I saw that video you, you talked about um, you know, selling your films to Netflix. How does an indie you know, film producer approach Netflix with a film, either, either as a film they want to produce or as one that they've already produced and they want to sell? Do you, can you go straight to Netflix? Because I know you talked about having to go through distributors, um, or should you find out who's distributing through Netflix and go to them? Yeah, you know, it, that has changed. When, if you heard my whole interview, I said, like, when I first did that, Netflix was a, a little bit of a smaller company, well, a lot smaller. And um, they were far more receptive to receiving pitches from producers. Now that they're, you know, this big, huge company, and there's, I still really enjoy dealing with them, and I think they're very fair. Um, it's much more difficult to get in, in the door there. Um, the other thing that's made it more difficult is that um, most of their focus and money is going into their own in-house productions, their branded productions, as opposed to acquiring third-party um, indie-made productions, whether it be films or TV shows. So. Um, a lot of the entry point is really through their branded di- division, meaning you want to work on one of their shows as opposed to pitch them on one of the shows that you want to make or a movie. In some ways, it's it's very, very difficult to do that now, even for me, and I have a relationship there. Um, so I would say that the best, as I said in my other interview, it's the best way to get in is with an established distributor who's already in the door. Um, because they'll at least listen. And, and, you know, what all the streamers want, just net, not only Netflix, all the streamers, all the broadcasters, um, obviously they want great content. That's number one, because that's what drives the, their businesses. But two is they, they kind of want predictability. Um, they want to know that the people they're dealing with can actually deliver what they say they're going to deliver. And, and that comes with kind of experience. And so even though there's a lot of producers who are great, you know, and, and they haven't done it. They, it doesn't mean they can't do it because I actually do believe they can do it in some ways better than the established producers because they're going to try harder. Um, it just means that they don't have a track record to say, hey, I've done it. Therefore, I'm predictable. You can rely on the fact that I'm going to do it. So it's kind of that whole chicken egg story, you know, like, give me my chance and I'll prove that I can do it. But we don't want to give you your chance because you haven't done it yet. So that's what makes it very frustrating. And that's why going in with an established distributor often um, can deal with that, cre- what I call the credibility issue, you know, saying, hey, yeah, at least we've done it many times before. So you know that we can deliver what we say we're going to deliver on time when you need it, and it's going to look good. And that's, you know, that's just, unfortunately, credibility that comes with, um, you know, ex- not necessarily, not only experience, but but projects that you've done, you know, and delivered successfully in the past. Yeah, you said it took you two films before they let you distribute directly to them, correct? You had to go through other distributors, yeah, but right? but that was about delivery, though. Maybe yeah. they, they, they trusted that I could make a good movie. After the first movie, you, you more or less earn your stripes and say, okay, at least after two, it's like, okay, the guy knows what he's doing. He can make a good movie. It's the story's told properly. It's engaging to watch, you know, everything's in focus. The sound is good. The music's good. Everything. So that's the content of the movie. What Netflix was more concerned about was the delivery. Can I, I mean, if you have ever seen a Netflix delivery schedule, I, I think it's about 20 pages long. And um, 
it's very extensive and you need to know what you're doing to deliver to their specs. And, and, you know, in the case of family films, I have to deliver 18 or 19 language versions, you know, six or seven subtitle versions. Delivery is a very extensive process. Um, all of the tracks, all of the metadata, everything. Um, so a lot of people don't take delivery so seriously or don't know how to do it properly. And that's what they were concerned about is, is really taking delivery. And, and frankly, I don't blame them because making delivery is not an easy, t- it's, it's very, um, it's, it's a complicated, intense process and you got to take it very seriously. It's almost as intense as making a movie, making delivery. So that's what their concern is. They don't want to deal with, it's, it's not that they don't think that filmmakers can't make good content. It's, they're just worried that they're not used to making good delivery. You obviously have a lot of experience doing this, um, which uh, brings me to my final question was uh, your consulting services. You also offer consulting services through Deverett Media, don't you? I do. I do. You know what? Um, I do lots of interviews. I actually also teach. I teach a course at San Diego State University. So I get lots and lots of uh, inquiries from students and filmmakers. You know, can you help explain distribution? Mostly about distribution. Can you help tell me about distribution or, or financing? And that's what I teach, financing and distribution. I don't teach production again. It's not my expertise, but those two are. So lots of people often ask me, and I'm talking lots and lots of people. You know, I get lots of emails. Um, and so I said, you know what? I just don't have enough time in the day. I wish I could talk to everybody. Honestly, I do, because I have a real soft spot for, for creative people, primarily um, writers and directors who are really trying and have a lot of passion. And um, But I just don't have enough time. So I decided I'll start a consulting service and I will offer my services out. Um, you pay, it's a fraction of what you would pay for a lawyer. And also I give lots of good legal advice because I am a lawyer. Um, so it's a pittance compared to what the lawyer charge. It's like a twofer there. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly. Um, you know, but, but, uh, you know, I'm not giving them, you know, their liability. I don't carry legal liability insurance or anything like that. There's just advice. Um, but but I give, um, you know, basically people hire me for either half an hour, hour, 90 minutes, and I, and I talk to them. And like I say, 90% of the questions are about distribution, as they should be. Um, you know, I'm either going to make a film and, you know, let's talk about how I get distributed before I make the film or I've made it and, you know, now I'm struggling. That's, that's a big part of it. And um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's the most difficult part of the film business. Um, and, and so people you know, need help with it. And I have a lot of experience, so I give a lot of help there. Um, but, you know, it's still challenging and the world is changing and there's going to be more changes and I, I see them coming and I'm kind of directing people in a different sort of direction to start forward thinking a little bit more. Hence the reason I just said those three things to your, to your writers, you know, start to think about what the producer thinks about and and you'll make your writing more commercially viable for the producer. And, you know, that's whereas in the yeah. 10 years ago, nobody had to think about that. You just had to think about making great content. Yeah. So if people do want your advice or want to see your work, where can they find you? Tom, I appreciate that you're letting me pitch. <laughs> you're letting, I mean, they find me on my website. It's called Deverett Media, D-E-V-E-R-E-T-T media.com. There's a thing called consulting. You go on and you book an appointment, and uh, that's where you find me. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us. Make sure you check him out online, and we will talk to you all soon. 